Well, hi, if I haven't met you before, my name is Andrew. I am a pastor at a church called The Bridge Church, it used to be called Church by the Bridge. Uh, my wife, Christine, and I, we used to be members of St. Aidan's up until about eight years ago. We love you all, we miss you. I wish we could be with you in person in your nice renovated church building, but here we are. It's still a pleasure to be able to be with you today and to open God's word with you. Let's pray as we come before God and his word. Father, we thank you for the gift of your son, the light of the world. Would you open our eyes now to see you more clearly and to trust you and follow you. And we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, I love those ads from Specsavers. You know those ads? You should have gone to Specsavers. Uh, whether it's the guy who has forgotten to wear his glasses and instead of grinding up coffee beans, he's grinding up dog food, or, or the person at the cricket match who thinks they're putting on their protection equipment but are actually putting on an avocado peel. You should have gone to Specsavers. What's so funny about those ads is they feature people who are so confident that they're seeing clearly. They're so confident that they're in the right place, doing the right thing, but actually, they are as blind as a bat. And that's what we see in our passage today, John chapter 9. It's a story all about sight. It features a blind man who ends up seeing, and a whole bunch of people who are so confident, just like the people from the Specsavers ads, so confident they're seeing clearly, but actually they're as blind as a bat. And you know today, God wants to give us an eye examination, a spiritual eye examination. Are we seeing clearly who Jesus is? Perhaps you remember the time when you first became a Christian, the time you first saw Jesus and how beautiful he is, how relevant he is, how life transforming he is. Maybe you've been a Christian for a while and your glasses have just gotten a little bit foggy. It's been a while since you were struck by the glory and the love and the beauty of Christ. Or maybe you're watching today and you've never been grasped by Christ. You've never seen Jesus as Lord and Saviour. My fear is that there are people watching today who think they see clearly. They, they think they understand who Jesus is. They think they understand the Bible and how to get to heaven, but actually, they're blind. Let's look at our story. There's three acts to our story today. And we've got to ask ourselves, as we do this spiritual eye examination, which of these people are us? Act number one the confusion of the disciples. The confusion of the disciples. Have a look at John chapter 9, verse 1. It says, As he was, went along, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. Now, it's worth just pausing here and just recognizing Jesus sees a man who everyone else ignores, a man with a disability, a man blind. But Jesus stops and he sees him. You know, as Christians, more than anyone else, we should be known for valuing and treasuring people with a disability because we know that they are loved and made by God. That's what Jesus does. He notices this man. And his disciples also notice the man. And the disciples ask Jesus a question. Verse 2, his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. They see the blind man and they're thinking, well, there's got to be a reason he's blind, that he's suffering like this. Either he sinned, or he sinned in a past life, or his parents sinned. Surely he deserves it. See, in their mind, there's some kind of tight connection between suffering that we go through and sin. Almost like God is a spiritual vending machine. You put good things in, good things come out. You put bad things in, bad things come out. Maybe you've heard this kind of thinking before. People saying things like, the reason you have cancer 
It's because you haven't trusted God enough. Because there's some kind of sin in your life you haven't repented of. Can I just say, this kind of logic, this kind of thinking is so, so wrong. There's three reasons why this kind of thinking that, that all kinds of suffering as a result of someone's sin is wrong. Three reasons why it's wrong. Firstly, it makes those who are healthy very proud. You see, for you, if you're healthy and everything's going well, if you think like that, you can say, well, gee, things are going well for me because I'm really godly. and I've been obeying God and how good am I? And those people over there that are suffering, they must have been sinful. It makes you proud. It makes you self-righteous. When really, God is a God of grace. Everything we have, we don't deserve. It's all because of his kindness. Second reason why this kind of thinking is so destructive is it's just not true when you look at the world. When we look around the world, we see people who are horrible people and are living it up. Everything's going well for them. And I'm sure we know other people who are suffering and yet they're wonderful people. It's just not true that every suffering is because we've been sinful. And the third reason why this thinking is so wrong is it's just cruel. It's just cruel. And so I just want to say, if anyone has ever said anything like that to you, I am so sorry. It is cruel. You only have to look at the story of Job in the Bible to see it's not true. Yes, in a sense, all suffering we experience is because of sin, the sin of Adam and Eve. Our world is corrupted. Our world is not perfect. And maybe sometimes suffering we go through is because of a particular sin. You're drunk driving and so you have a crash and you hurt yourself. But the vast majority of the cases, that is not the case. And so Jesus, he answers the disciples' question. He says, neither. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, says Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus says, you're wrong, disciples. The reason this has happened, the reason this man is blind is because God is about to show us something incredible. So let's look at what that is. Act number two. The blind man sees. The blind man sees. Let's look what happens next in the story. Verse 5. Verse 5, Jesus says, While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I don't know about you, but this year has been a pretty dark year for many people. 2020 as well, pretty dark year. But Jesus is the light of the world. He is shining in this dark world. His mercy, his grace, his hope, his love. And Jesus says to the disciples, I'm the light of the world. And what he does is he wants to show them that he's the light of the world. And so he does something really strange. He bends down and spits in the mud. It's not very COVID safe. But anyway, spits in the mud puts the mud on this man's eyes, gets him to wash it off, and the man, who once was blind, can now see for the very first time. It's just incredible. Now, why the mud? What with all that? Why did Jesus have to do such a dirty way of, of, of cleaning someone's, uh, helping someone see? Well, I think it reminds us of God at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis. Remember the story of Genesis, the world, the whole universe was dark. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And out of the dust of the earth, God created humans. And here we have Jesus who says, I am the light of the world. And out of the dust and the mud of the ground, he creates Create sight where there was no sight. Jesus is showing us he's God. 
He's God. In fact, in the Old Testament, there were lots of prophecies about one day God's Messiah, God's King coming, who would heal the sight of the blind. And here's Jesus saying, that's me. I'm the King you've been waiting for. I'm God's Messiah. Well, all the mates of this blind man and his neighbours, they're shocked. Verse 8, they say, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. They're saying to themselves, this can't be the same guy. Maybe he has an identical twin that was never blind. Or maybe he's got a stunt double that we didn't know about. There's no way he can really now see. I love it. Maybe you've experienced that when you became a Christian and God transformed your life and your friends, your family, couldn't believe it. They said things like, oh, she's just going through a phase. She'll get over it. This won't last. Well, no, this man, his life has been turned upside down by the Lord Jesus. He once was blind, he now can see. But actually him getting physical sight is actually not the main point of the story. <laughs> if, if that's all we get from this, we're, just, we're missing most of it. Actually, this man doesn't just get physical sight, he gets spiritual sight. He understands, he grasps who Jesus is. When I was in high school, I did the 40-hour famine. Um, I actually did it with a bunch of people from St. Aidan's. And um, uh, for 40 hours, instead of giving up food, I gave up sight. I wore a massive blindfold for 40 hours. It was really hard. Simple things like brushing my teeth, going to the toilet, was a very complicated affair, I can tell you that. And um, it's hard to describe that moment when I first saw again after those 40 hours. When before I was fumbling in the darkness and all of a sudden I had sight, clarity, colour. Well, God says that by default, every single one of us are fumbling around in the darkness spiritually when it comes to God. Every single one of us have rejected God. We're, we're living for other things instead of God. We're serving other things. We're trying to save ourselves. We don't know God. We're stuck and lost in our sin. And what we need is God to turn the spiritual lights on. We need God to open our eyes and show us who Jesus is. And that's what happens to this man. Yes, he got physical sight, but actually he goes on a journey and his spiritual eyes are opened. Have a look at the journey he goes on. It is a journey. Verse 11. His friends ask him who did this. In verse 11, the man replied, the man they call Jesus did it. So at the point of verse 11, for the blind man, Jesus is just a man. But keep going, fast forward to verse 17. This time the Pharisees are grilling him. The Pharisees are interrogating him. Who did this? Verse 17. The man replied, he is a prophet. So he's gone from viewing Jesus as just a man to viewing him as a prophet. What next? Fast forward to verse 33. Verse 33, the man who was blind says, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And then jump to verse 38. How does he end the story? What does he say about Jesus? Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Lord, I believe. Do you see his spiritual journey he's gone on? From viewing Jesus as just a man to be able to say, Lord, I believe. See, I actually think that's how many people become a Christian today. I don't think it's often that people become a Christian overnight in 2021. For many people, it is a journey. 
of exploring who Jesus is, of coming to church, of asking questions, of reading the Bible. And do you notice the way this man goes on a journey to, phys- to spiritual sight is by examining the evidence. Do you notice that? Now, don't let anyone ever tell you that being a Christian isn't grounded on any evidence. That to be a Christian, you've got to leave your brain at the door. That is not true. Now, this man, for him to have his spiritual eyes open, he's examining the evidence. Uh, He's constantly being interrogated. And he says in verse 25, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. He's saying to the Pharisees, look, I'm just looking at the facts. All I know is this, I used to be blind, now I see. He's facing the evidence. He's, He's examining, he's thinking. Now, The Pharisees don't want to face the evidence. They're doing everything they can to avoid the conclusion that Jesus really did this. So they they think, well, maybe he wasn't born blind. Maybe this blindness was just temporary. Maybe he looked at the sun for a little bit too long and he's just kind of been blind for the last week or so. And so they get his parents. They grill his parents. Was he really born blind? And his parents say, well, he was born blind. But we read that they're too afraid to admit that Jesus is the Messiah because they don't want to get kicked out of the synagogue. They're afraid of the consequences. But this man will examine the evidence and is not afraid of the consequences. Even if it means him getting kicked out of the synagogue, he is not afraid of the truth. I truly believe that following Jesus makes the most sense of all the evidence of this world. Uh, Makes the most sense of the cosmos, of history, of morality, of rationality. And not just the most sense at an academic level, but experientially. Following Jesus, I think, makes life beautiful. Makes life beautiful. I'm just going to encourage you if you're watching today and you're on a journey exploring who Jesus is, and you're not sure whether you trust and follow him, keep going on the journey. Keep examining the evidence. Keep reading the scriptures and looking at who Jesus claims to be. That's what this man did. And he went on a journey from not just physical to sight, physical blindness to physical sight, but spiritual blindness to spiritual sight. And he says, I once was blind, but now I see. Act one, the confusion of the disciples, thinking that this man's blindness was because of a sin in his life. Act two, the blind man sees. Act three, those who think they can see become blind. Those who think they can see become blind. See, what does light do? Light reveals, but light also blinds. I feel like the the new cars of today, their headlights are just getting brighter, aren't they? Is it just me? I feel like I'm constantly being blinded by the oncoming car's headlights. Now for them, those lights are revealing. But for me, they're blinding. That's what light does. Jesus says he's the light of the world. For some people, it's revealing who he is. But for others, it blinds. And you see it in the story, as the man has his spiritual eyes open, you see the eyes of these religious Pharisees get more and more blinded and the mist covering their eyes as the story goes on. Uh, I am... Enjoy going to the optometrist. Stephen Daly, I'm overdue for an appointment. Uh, I enjoy going to the optometrist because I know that I have pretty good sight. At least I think I do. Uh, I can see things long distance pretty well. And I like to brag about this to my wife, Christine. I'll, you know, she's got glasses. I like to brag about, oh, my, I, my eyesight is so good. But she likes to remind me that my eyesight is not as good as I claim it to be because I do what she calls a boy look. 
Are you aware of this phenomenon, a boy look? It's when I go to the cupboard and I'm looking for the sticky tape. I say, hey, Christine, where's the sticky tape? She yells out, it's in the middle shelf. I look and I say, it's not there, where is it? Middle shelf on the left, she will yell out. I say, sorry, can't see it. And so Christine gets up and I, she walks towards me and I hear her footsteps. I'm thinking she's going to find it straight away. And sure enough, when she gets there, it's right there in front of my eyes. And she tells me off for doing a boy look. Are you aware of this phenomenon? Maybe you know someone in your life who does a boy look. Here I am bragging that I can see so clearly when really I can't see what's right in front of me. And that is what happens to these Pharisees. See, they think they understand it all. They're religious. They're spiritual teachers. They know the Old Testament. They think God saves them because of the way that they live and their, their good works. But actually, they can't see God right in front of them, Jesus. Instead of having their eyes open, they're blinded. They hold up their religious rules to avoid the truth. They say, verse 16, well, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. In their mind, because Jesus doesn't keep their religious rules about the Sabbath, he can't be God. They refuse to admit that he is the Lord and Saviour. They refuse to be Jesus' disciples. Instead, they say, verse 28, we are disciples of Moses. And they even insult the blind man and throw him out of the synagogue. <laughs> They're so blind. They don't think they need Jesus. They don't think they need saving. And they focus more on their made-up laws. You know, the worst type of blindness you can have is when you're blind to your own blindness. The worst type of blindness you can have is when you're blind to your own blindness. If you're driving a car and you're having trouble all of a sudden seeing the road signs and you're crashing into things and you refuse to admit you need to get an eye check, that is dangerous, all right? That is dangerous. And when it comes to God, when it comes to Jesus, the worst type of blindness is when you don't even realise that you're lost. You don't even realise that you need saving. You don't even realise you need Jesus. Because there can be no cure for those who reject the only cure there is. Jesus Christ these Pharisees, they're trusting in themselves. They think they've earned their way to God. They think they've got it all sorted. And they're actually blind to Jesus, the Son of God who's in front of them. And the warning for us is, you might be watching, you might come to church. You might have grown up in a Christian family. You might be an impressive, a good person. And you're blinded the fact that you actually need to ask Jesus to forgive you. I am a pastor in a very wealthy area, Kirribilli, Neutral Bay, the North Shore. A lot of successful people here all around me right now. And here, many people are blinded to their need for God, blinded by their wealth, blinded by their success. What is it for you? What is it for the people of Hurstville Grove, Oatley, Connells Point, Pensis, Mortdale? To turn, to recognise Jesus and who he is, to have your eyes open to him, is to turn to him and trust him and follow him and accept him as your Lord and Saviour. It's the best decision you will ever make. So who are you going to be? Jesus says in verse 39, at the end of our story, verse 39, he says, for judgment I have come into the world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Who are you going to be? The man who has his eyes opened by God, who trusts and says to Jesus, Lord, I believe. Or will you continue to ignore God and be blinded by the world, by sin? 
by all kinds of other things you may be living for or chasing after and miss the hope, the joy, the truth, the peace that's found in Jesus. You need a saviour. You need the grace and the kindness that's found in Christ. Perhaps you're on a journey, just like that blind man was. You're, you're exploring who Jesus is. Or perhaps you're ready to follow Jesus today. You may remember the story of John Newton. John Newton was a slave trader. He was not a Christian. He was blind to God, living life apart from God. And one day his eyes were opened and he received God's mercy and forgiveness and trusted Jesus. And he wrote the most famous song that has ever been written. And this song, if, if you follow Jesus, if your eyes have been opened to Jesus' beauty and grace, to his love, then this song that he wrote can become the cry of your heart. Here's the song. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your amazing grace, your kindness to us, your love to us, your forgiveness. Thank you, Father, that you saved a wretch like me. You gave us what we didn't deserve. Thank you that you cured our spiritual blindness. I pray for people watching today who are exploring who Jesus is or have not yet followed him. We pray, Father, that you would help them on this journey, that you would open their eyes to your word, open their eyes to Jesus and show them your grace. Lord, help us never to become comfortable or forget how wonderful Jesus is. But each day to be reminded again from your word and your Holy Spirit and to praise you, sing to you and rejoice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.